So again, this is the building called Donnie's House, and it's at least in the neighborhood where he spent a good part of his childhood, but we know little about his early life or where he really lived. It's interesting that we can't document any formal schooling for someone who had obviously read everything he could get his hands on. However, the lack of formal schooling is not unusual in a literary genius. Cervantes, Moliere, Shakespeare, all put together, didn't have enough years of formal education to make one grade school graduate. Yet a lot of people would have you believe Shakespeare didn't write Hamlet because he didn't go to Cambridge. I think people say things like this in part because they're just so far from genius themselves that they really have no idea about what it can accomplish. It's often said that the Divine Comedy is praised by everyone and read by no one, and I think that's close to the truth. Kenneth Clark calls it the greatest philosophic poem ever. Carlyle calls it the sincerest poem ever. Eliot says, Dante and Shakespeare, there is no third. But Will Durant calls it the most difficult poem ever written, and that might be the easiest of these claims to defend. Durant also doesn't like the Divine Comedy. He says it's indecent and defiles God. Lope de Vega is another who doesn't like it. On his deathbed, he's supposed to have said, All right, now I can say it. Dante makes me sick. On May Day, 1274, when he was nine, Dante was invited to a party at the house of Folco Portonare in Florence. It was at this party, as he says in his autobiographical Vita Nuova, that he saw Beatrice Portinari, also nine for the first time, and to himself said, Ecce Deus fortior me qui veniens domina beater mihi. Behold a God stronger than I, coming to rule me. He didn't see her for another nine years, and one can't help but notice the number of nines and threes that show up in his life as well as in his poetry. We don't know exactly where he saw her the second time, but it might have been around here. Her father founded the Hospital of Santa Maria Nuova, which still exists, though not in its original buildings, at the end of what is now Via Portinari here. Donnie and Beatrice were both 18 by this time, and one might think a more interesting encounter would have taken place, but all that transpired was some brief conversation. Donnie says she spoke graciously to him and he went home full of inspiration. He essentially wrote from the same point of view as the troubadours whom he admired so much. So when Beatrice married a member of the Bardi family a few years later, he was not upset in the way a jilted lover might be expected to have been. He required, like the troubadours, an ideal inaccessible woman as his inspiration. It's tempting to think that Donnie joined the Florentine army in 1289, sort of in the way in which one might have joined the Foreign Legion to forget a lost love, but the Battle of Campaldino, in which he fought for the victorious Florentines against Arezzo here, was probably fought before her wedding. In any case, I doubt his reasons for joining the army had anything to do with Beatrice. He was probably partly at least motivated by the desire to go into politics and then as now, a few battle scars are worth some votes. Beatrice died the next year in childbirth at the age of 24, and he lamented her death, but without her presence in heaven, there would have been no divine comedy. It's Beatrice who sends Virgil to him, to lead him to salvation, to save him from hell, to which a life in politics would have certainly doomed him. It's popularly believed that Beatrice was buried here in the Church of Santa Margareta, which was apparently the parish church of both the Alighieri and Portinari families. I guess I didn't mention it earlier, but Dante is Dante Alighieri. Like quite a few other famous people of the Renaissance, he's, he's better known by his first name than his last. 
It might be, though, that Beatrice was buried in the chapel of her husband's family in Santa Croce, the Bardi Chapel there, the one decorated by Giotto that we saw before the break. In any case, Donnie himself was apparently married here in the early 1290s to a woman named Gemma Donati, about whom we know very little. I don't believe he ever mentions her or their eight or so children in anything he wrote. As I mentioned above, great poets apparently need ideal inspiration. No great poet has ever written about his wife, right? Wives change diapers, wash dishes, mow the lawn, in some families anyway. Beatrice Portinari and Julia Roberts are never seen doing that kind of thing. Boccaccio and Petrarch never married at all, and a surprising number of the great Florentine artists were also lifelong bachelors. Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, for example. This truncated tower house is all the remains of the house where Donnie's wife's family lived. At this time, Florence was essentially a Guelph city, meaning you may remember that it supported the Pope, essentially, in his political ambitions in central Italy. The Ghibellines were those who supported the cause of the Emperor against the Pope. Within Florence, however, there were those who were more enthusiastic Guelphs. They were called Blacks, and then there were those who were sort of closet Ghibellines called Whites. Corso Donati, the head of Donnie's wife's family, was a Black, and Donnie was a White. In 1300, Donnie was one of the six priors running the Florentine government and was instrumental in getting Corso Donati exiled. <laughs> In 1302, however, Pope Boniface VIII invited the brother of Philip IV of France, Charles of Valois, into Italy to support his cause, and the blacks, including Corso, were able to return to Florence, and Donny was thrown out of the city. Boniface, whom you see in a portrait here attributed to Arnolfo di Cambio, should have studied history a little more, however. You may remember that in the 13th century, another pope invited Charles of Anjou, the brother of St. Louis, Louis IX, and to support him and wound up regretting it. Boniface's invitation proved ultimately an even bigger mistake. In 1305, the French army virtually forced the election of a French pope who moved the headquarters of the papacy to Avignon, where it remained more or less a century. Boniface is one of the eight popes Donnie put in hell, and perhaps the only joke told in the inferno is at his expense. Dottie and Virgil are making their way through the gloom when some poor soul looks up from the muck at the poet and says, Oh, it's you, Boniface the Eighth. To which Dottie replies, Me? I'm not Boniface, but he'll be arriving any time now. There aren't many laughs in the Divine Comedy. It's a comedy only in the Aristotelian sense that it ends happily. <laughs> This is the portrait of the Emperor Henry VII that once decorated his tomb by Tino de Camaino in the Campo Santo in Pisa. Donnie pinned his hopes on this fellow, whom he wanted to have become the new Augustus, who would reunify Italy and restrict the Pope to spiritual affairs. But Henry VII was more like Mr. Rogers than Augustus Caesar. He got as far as Pisa and died. Donnie spent the rest of his life at various Ghibelline courts, and was threatened with being burned at the stake if he ever returned to Florence. It's not surprising that he doesn't say many nice things about Florence in the Divine Comedy. In one place he calls it a dunghill fit for goats. great Italian composer was also a 14th century Florentine, Francesco Landini. This is his tomb in San Lorenzo in Florence. He was blind, but for many years he was the organist of this church. Although only secular songs by him survived, like Setofalito, which you're hearing, Between Landini and the great Venetians of the 16th century, there are few Italian-born 
composers whose names you might recognize. There was a lot of great music written in Italy in the 15th century, but it was almost all by fellows from France, Flanders, and Germany. You can see another portrait of him here in a manuscript illustration. He's playing his favorite instrument, the portative organ, the ancestor of the accordion. Another song by Landini now while we see a little bit of Verona. Donnie spent a good deal of the rest of his life in Verona and may well have written quite a bit of the Divine Comedy there as well under the patronage of the Scaligeri family, the Della Scala or Scaligeri family. This song by Landini is called La Bionda, the Blonde. <laughs> This is Verona from the air with the castle of the Della Scala family, Donnie's patrons, in the distance on the edge of the city. Here's the castle up closer. This is the Pani Scaligero, which crosses the DJ River to it. The fishtail battlements are sometimes called Ghibelline, while the square topped ones are called Guelph, but there isn't a consistent political significance to them really. The Piazza della Erbe, where the old Roman Forum was. The cemetery with the downtown residents of the Della Scala's behind it. Here you can see the scala, the ladder, which is the family symbol in the grill work. In a roundabout way, the La Scala Opera House in Milan is named after them. Here's Ken Grande della Scala, the head of the family while Donnie was here, and to whom, if a surviving letter is genuine, he dedicated the Paradiso. It's hard to believe there wasn't supposed to be something humorous about this statue of Con Grande. He appears to have a big grin on his face, kind of paunchy, and looks sort of like a clown in armor, and his horse certainly doesn't look very warlike. His name means the big dog in Italian, and he has a fierce dog's head on the top of his helmet. He also apparently took the name Can Grande to suggest something like Great Con, as though he were like Genghis Khan. He was the great Khan of Verona. Will Durant says that the love story of Donnie and Beatrice is the most famous in history, but it isn't. The most famous love story in history, of course, is about Romeo and Juliet, and this is traditionally identified as Juliet's balcony in Verona. 
Aldani refers to the Montecchi, who were Ghibellines from Verona, and to the Capoletti, who were Guelphs from Cremona, and these families get into Shakespeare through a 16th century story by Matteo Bandello, as, in English, the Montagues and Capulets. But Donny says nothing about Romeo and Juliet. The story's pure fiction, and yet the usually reliable Guide Michelin says that Romeo and Juliet committed suicide here about 1302 in the reign of Frederick I. Come on, where are your editors? In addition to giving a date to a fictional event, they compound the error by saying it took place at the time of an emperor who'd already been dead for a century. This is the part of Verona Donnie would probably have known best, and there's a modern statue to commemorate his residence here. The so-called Prefettura at the back, next to the cemetery we saw earlier, was the downtown residence of the Della Scala family, his patrons. As I think I mentioned earlier, the Divine Comedy is a kind of meta-poem, meaning that it's difficult to make much out of it without reading a lot of other literature first. There are something like 125 names in the Inferno alone, all of them names of people who died more than 700 years ago. Names can, of course, be very evocative, but only if you know something about the people they go with. For most readers, they are just 125 words and very important words without meanings. Donnie was probably the greatest name dropper in history, sort of the Herb Cain of hell. He claims to have met just about every important person in the history of Europe. This is a portrait of Donnie attributed to Giotto in the Bargello in Florence. It probably isn't by Giotto, but it's very likely that Donnie and Giotto did meet. They do have a certain similarity of approach in common. For both of them, for example, it is the human drama that matters. Neither devotes much attention to the natural world. But really, I guess that's about all they have in common. Where Giotto is usually subtle and restrained, Donnie is full of the sort of grotesque energy of the medieval sculptors. Donnie, for all his Christian perspective, does, however, make some interesting concessions to classicism. His guide in the Inferno is Virgil, of course, and he puts eight popes in hell while putting the pagan emperor Trajan in paradise. Also, he allows the heroes of the classical world no worse punishment than limbo, where they get to lie around in the shade and talk about philosophy. He even invokes the aid of Apollo to help him describe paradise. Here's the modern statue of Dante in front of Santa Croce in Florence. Despite all the nasty things he says about it, Florence now honors him as though he were her favorite son. This might look like the generosity of forgiveness, but it's really, I think, just an attempt to capitalize on his reputation. Dante is supposed to have said that he wrote the Divine Comedy in Italian so that even housewives could understand it, but I'm doubtful how many housewives, whether Italian or not, have profited from this. And for most of us, of course, the fact that the original is in Italian just makes it all the more difficult to read. Writers and a fortiori poets are at a big disadvantage compared with other creative people like painters and musicians in trying to communicate with people who don't speak their language. The Arena Chapel doesn't have to be translated. I once had a professor who argued that he didn't bother to learn foreign languages because he could always get a translation of what he wanted by someone who was a professional and far more able as a translator than he could ever be. But I don't like that viewpoint. With just a little knowledge of Italian, I think you can add a lot to your experience of reading things like the Divine Comedy. You don't need to be fluent. If you're going to invest the time to read it at all, it's worth putting in a little more to get some idea of the sound and character of the original. The sound of a language itself carries part of the meaning of what's said in it. This is Donnie's tomb in Ravenna where he died in 1321. Apparently some deal was made by the Florentines with the Nazis in World War II to get his bones from here and some bones were turned over, but after the war, the people in Ravenna said, Ha, 
Fooled you, we gave you the wrong bones. Now this is where Francesco Petrarca, known as Petrarch in English, was born. Like Dante, Petrarch's father was a white and was also forced to leave Florence on the arrival of Charles of Valois in 1302. Arezzo, like Verona, was a Ghibelline city, so he settled here. Unlike Dante, however, he decided to make his peace with the church and went off to Avignon where the papacy was headquartered and where there was a lot of work for lawyers of which he was one. So it was in and around Avignon that Francesco, the future Petrarch, grew up. This is Avignon. You can see the papal palace there near the river with the ruins of the famous Pont d'Avignon, the bridge of Avignon that the old song is about. From around 1305 to 1377, this is where the popes made their home until Catherine of Siena persuaded Gregory XI to return to Rome. Unfortunately, he died almost immediately, and the Italian cardinals elected an Italian pope, and the French cardinals elected a French pope, which produced the schism that would last until 1417. For a while, there was even a third pope, and since all the popes excommunicated all the followers of the other popes, everyone in Christianity was excommunicate, which, to say the least, was worrisome and confusing to the ordinary Christian in the street. Here you can see the facade of the palace up closer now. Benedict XII and Clement VI were the popes responsible for most of the palace as we see it now. Most of the Avignon popes were not good role models, but even the worst were not all bad, despite the fact that Petrarch himself described Avignon as hell on earth, a sink of vice in the sewer of the world. <laughs> All the wealth and luxury, which all admit filled the palace, has long since gone and it's hard to imagine what it was once like. There is supposed to have been something like a billion dollars in gold in the treasury at one time. Most of the popes here were, or wanted to be, regarded as scholars and patrons of the arts, but the middle of the 14th century was not a great age for the arts. Giotto was invited, but died before he could come. Simone Martini came, but nothing survives here that he did. The most impressive surviving decoration in the Papal Palace consists of the frescoes made under the direction of Matteo Giovannetti, who was an associate, at least, of Simone Martini's and also an acquaintance of Petrarch. This is a view of his work in the chapel of Saint Jean in the Papal Palace here. Like most Italian painters of the mid-14th century, however, despite the fact he worked for the popes, he's not as well known as those before and after him and appears in the standard art histories of neither Stockstead nor Jansen. In 1417, the Council of Constance put an end to the whole papal mess by deposing all would-be popes and naming Martin V to take over, and he returned to Rome. The corrupt period of the Avignon captivity, as it is often called, gave a lot of ammunition to reformers. Jan Hus was burned at the stake by the same council that elected Martin V, but he did have a great influence, and with a within a century, the church would face Luther and split apart forever. As I said, we do know that Simone Martini worked in Avignon, and while nothing he did survives there, he did illustrate Petrarch's own copy of Virgil's Georgics, which is now in the Ambrosian Library in Milan. Petrarch's father sent him to study law in Bologna, but he didn't like it. He said that he didn't want to learn a profession, he didn't want to practice dishonestly, and couldn't practice any other way. He wanted to be a poet, and on... Good Friday, 1327, he got the inspiration he needed when he saw Laura and wrote on the flyleaf of this very book the date of the encounter. She went on to marry a member of the Desaad family and have twelve kids and die in her thirties, but she performed the same role for Petrarch that Beatrice did for Dante. She was his ideal, inaccessible woman. Petrarch says that when he visited Rome, he wrote some of his 350 or so sonnets to Laura sitting on the tomb of Bibulus. 
In the 14th century, this was a good deal more bucolic a setting than it is today. Now what's left of it is dwarfed by the Vittorio Emanuele Monument, and the traffic of the Piazza Venezia roars by. <laughs> Unlike Donnie and Boccaccio, Petrarch didn't write one big magnum opus, so it's a little more difficult to find his poems, or anything else he wrote. The Divine Comedy and the Decameron can be found in any bookstore, even in some drugstores, but you'll have to go to a very large bookstore or a library to find anything by Petrarch. This is a portrait of Petrarch, a little sketch is all it is, really. It's attributed to an artist named Altichiro de Zavio. Durant says you may think of Petrarch as the first modern man until you've read what he wrote. But that's not fair. He and Boccaccio are in a different world than Dante. Many of Petrarch's prose works sound remarkably modern. In his letter to posterity, in fact, he's talking right to us. He says that if we've read his poetry, we might want to know something about him. And he says he was handsome enough on his best days, didn't have to wear glasses till he was 60, that his favorite subject is history, that his favorite pastime is having dinner with friends, and so on. This is all very modern sounding, very conversational. Donny may in fact have been a jovial dinner companion too, but his literary personality wouldn't lead you to invite him to many parties. This is a sketch Petrarch himself drew of Vaucluse, east of Avignon, where he spent much of his time for about 15 years. And we'll hear a nice song called Echo la Primavera, Behold Spring is Here, by Francesco Landini, while we see some pictures of Vaucluse as it looks today. Petrarch was actually once the judge of a music contest, won by Landini, so he probably knew him. Here you can see the castle ruin that stands on the, the rim of the cliff above Vaucluse. It's popularly called Petrarch's house. It bears some resemblance to the, the building and the location you see in the sketch. Down at river level. Looking back up at the castle. castle up closer. This is Mont Ventoux now from Avignon. And Vaucluse is on the slope to the right, to the south, I guess, as you look at Mont Ventoux from here. It doesn't look like that big a mountain, but as you see now in this aerial view, it uh, can look pretty high from this angle. In 1338, Petrarch hiked to the top of it, and his account of this is sometimes considered the first record of a mountain climb. He made the excursion with his brother, who was more of an athlete, and kept going on ahead and then sitting down to wait for him and then starting off again as soon as he'd arrived so that Petrarch never got any rest. You've probably been hiking with people like that. Like his letter to posterity, this account of his climb makes very entertaining reading and could have been written yesterday instead of 700 years ago. In 1356, Petrarch served as the ambassador from Giovanni Visconti in Milan to the Emperor Charles IV at his capital in Prague. He was also the King of Bohemia. Petrarch, like his father, was, as I mentioned earlier, sympathetic to the Ghibellines in Italy. 
But Charles IV did no more than Henry VII to become a real Italian political figure and put the Pope in his place. This is Karlstein, Charles's country retreat, which Petrarch may have visited. It's now mostly 19th century, but it is still quite an impressively built and situated place. There's a curious room in it which has a throne situated between two windows in such a way that the occupant of the throne is cast into shadow while anyone in front of him is bathed in bright light. The emperor's expression was thus concealed while every nuance in the face of the ambassador would be revealed. An intimidating arrangement to which Petrarch may have been subjected. Petrarch also served the Visconti as ambassador to Venice and made a deal with the Venetians to will his library to the city in exchange for the Palazzo Molina to use as a residence. And many of his books and papers are still in the Libraria Vecchia across the Piazzetta from the Doge's palace. When he died, he was living in Arqua, about 20 miles from Venice, and he was buried there in this tomb. He said in the letter to posterity that death would find him reading and writing, and that's the way he was found, having passed away at his desk. By that time, he had long been friends with the third of the great Italian writers of the century, Giovanni Boccaccio, and in his will, he left him money to buy a decent suit of clothes. of Boccaccio, painted long after his death by Andrea del Castaño. It is sometimes claimed that he was born in Paris, the illegitimate son of a traveling salesman father, but it's more likely he was born in Certaldo. Petrarch's father wanted him to be a lawyer. Boccaccio's wanted him to be an accountant, and I think if you want to be a poet, it's even worse to have to study accounting than to have to study law. He was apprenticed to a businessman in Naples, but managed to have an affair with the illegitimate daughter of the king himself, Robert d'Anjou, whom we saw a while ago being given the crown of Naples in the picture by Simone Martini of Robert's brother, Saint Louis of Toulouse. This girl was known as Fiametta, or Little Hot Flame, and their relationship was not like that of Donny de Beatrice or Petrarch de Laura, and maybe just because Fiametta was very accessible, Boccaccio didn't become as great a poet as they did. He was living in Florence when the Black Death arrived in 1348. This is the Loggia del Begallo in Florence, a sort of souvenir of the Black Death. The members of the Confraternity della Misericordia, which was headquartered here, took it upon themselves to help those who were stricken and to bury the dead. The members were those who had recovered from the Black Death or who for other reasons thought themselves immune, but these were brave men nevertheless. No one really knew what caused the disease. Death came from massive infection and high fever, usually in three to five days. And while the numbers given vary, something like 60% of the population of Florence probably died from it, and perhaps as much as a third of the entire population of Europe. As I said when I was talking about Lorenzetti, it's difficult to find the names of people who are actual victims. In William McNeil's lengthy account of the Black Death in Plagues and Peoples, he doesn't, I think, give a single name. Besides Lorenzetti, possible victims sometimes mentioned include the Florentine diarist Villani and Petrarch's Laura, both of whom did die in 1348 of some cause. It was to avoid the chaos and horror produced by the Black Death in Florence that Boccaccio's people met one day after church here in Santa Maria Novella and decided to leave town. This church is second only to Santa Croce for art in Florence and will be back here several times over the course of the quarter. In the Campo Santo in Pisa, 
There's a series of frescoes sometimes attributed to Francesco Traini which could serve as a set of illustrations for the Decameron and may have in fact been inspired by it. We see a group of people who could very well be Boccaccio's group riding out and passing unpleasant reminders of the scourge they're hoping to avoid. And now we see them arrived in the country where they pass the time telling the stories that make up the Decameron. Each of the refugees tells a story a day for 10 days, and to give you some idea of their subject matter and character, I'll just quote from a few of the little introductions to them. The fifth tale on the eighth day is about how three young men take the pants from a judge of the marches in Florence while he's sitting on the bench. The seventh tale on the eighth day. A scholar is in love with a widow who loves someone else and makes him wait for her a whole winter's night in the snow. By a trick of his, he then makes her spend a whole July day naked in a tower, exposed to the sun and flies. This is the second tale on the ninth day. An abbess gets out of bed hastily in the dark to catch one of her nuns who is accused of being with a lover. The abbess herself is in bed with a priest and puts his pants on her head, mistaking them for her veil. You might not think that stories like these would provide proper material for a work considered to be the greatest prose accomplishment of Italian literature, but it's important to remember here again that it's the genius, not the subject, that makes the masterpiece. A great genius can make a masterpiece out of anything, whether he's a painter, a composer, or a writer. This is the Villa Palmieri now, said to occupy the location of the country house to which Boccaccio's people came to tell their stories. One thing to notice also is that most of the stories are funny. Donny doesn't think anything is funny. Donnie is certainly critical of the church. Remember, he put eight popes in hell, but that doesn't make the same impact that ridicule does. I'd rather be thought bad than ridiculous any day. Boccaccio was not the first to mock the clergy. The celebrated Carmina Burana of the 12th and 13th centuries do plenty of that, for example, long before Boccaccio, but his attitude does have the effect of making him seem more modern, and the humor certainly helps to make him more accessible to most modern readers than Donnie is. It's also important to notice that making fun of the clergy was tolerated in literature long before it was tolerated in the visual arts. No important artist will paint the clergy looking silly until about 1500. This double standard is still around. Libraries that would never consider stocking penthouse hustler and magazines of that sort think nothing of having all sorts of printed erotica from Lady Chatterley's Lover to Harlequin romances on their shelves. Whatever psychology is behind this will have to be sorted out by someone else because that's the end of the lecture for today. Next time we'll hear about the official beginning of the Renaissance with the Baptistry Door Competition in Florence and also hear about Donatello and Masaccio.